That's good. That is good. So how are things upstairs this morning? Okay. Yeah. On the pipe. Yeah. And he starts to go through the bodies. Okay. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Kind of. Sure, I'll, I'll, oh, uh, well, they're, they're on my email. Do you want me to email them to you? Um, Brianna just emailed them to me. Okay. Which means that no one's, they didn't see eye to eye by him. Who knows? <laughs> Hmm. No, we actually are. Yeah, I don't have Jason. Yeah, he didn't send them to us, so I don't know. So she's going to go down first, and then I'll catch up later. The girls are actually coming down, which is good. I'm going fast. I was going to say, remember, we only have like five minutes. And I could see Jason Hodges running around taking pictures. So he was out in front of the. In front of the uh, yeah, material science. Some it oh, looked like him. Yeah. We need his slides too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
No, I like that five minutes. Just like just go like this. Okay. Just so we know we're at five. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, and then is he gonna be the slot? Is was Jason still not here? Okay, He's also not until Thursday. Yeah. He just had he didn't email Brandon on the slides either, so but he can as long as he has no memory. No. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. He might not have that. Yeah, I don't care. I don't know. Oh, I'll take a look at that In terms of the amount of vapor transpiration that will come off it to be able to affect temperature. And so if you can get a mild wide shape shelter belt and crescent along the west side of the I think actually we could have an impact on that. And use that park line. And of course you have, you have to buy up that mild strip. But in that area between here and Reese, it has to be a little further out though. They will, they will affect it. We will be too close. Summertime, the mm winds -hmm. are from the south a little, little more, so it has to loop around. It has to loop around. Yeah. So you're interested in the summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're interested well, in really yeah. that southwest, that southwest yeah. 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 But if you had a shelter that mm -hmm. large enough, you could actually modify climate sufficiently. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we welcome you back for the last installment of this poll of the Climate Science Center Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. Uh, first, a few announcements before we get started. Uh, I want to thank um, Urban Tech and Mark Humphrey's chair uh, for sponsoring today's seminar. Appreciate that. Uh, the last Science by the Glass uh, event will be held uh, December 13th at Fox and Hale. Uh, drinks at 5, the talk will begin at 6, featuring Dr. Ken Baki. Okay. <laughs> this, the, the Swedish, Finnish, names, which is bad because I'm that's my background too. They would throw me off. The uh, title of the discussion will be Oil, is it still God's given gift? Or yeah, God's given gift. Well, I'd say by the latest discovery is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Um, so be sure and uh, put that on your calendar. Also, want to remind you, uh, the Global Weirding series again. Uh, new episodes are released every uh, Wednesday, every other Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, so be sure to, to subscribe to a Global Weirding uh, Global Weirding Series uh, to watch the episodes and also every other Thursday, Dr. Hago will have the answering questions uh, via Facebook live chat at seven o'clock. So uh, put those on your calendar as well. Okay, uh, today's series is on uh, urban sustainability and climate change. Our first panelist today is uh, David Driscoll, who is an associate professor in the College of Architecture and is the director of the Urban Tech Design Center. He received his Bachelor's uh, of Architecture from Texas Tech and received his Master's of Architecture specifically focusing on urban design from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. He is the executive board member of the Lubbock Regional Arts Center and vice president and board member of the Tech Terrace UNIT neighborhoods. He has received many honors and awards on being, uh, excuse me, one being in 2001 where he received the President's Excellence in Teaching Award at Texas Tech. He's also written several publications and participated in several community outreach programs. Ladies and gentlemen, David Driscoll. I think that bio is uh, not the same age as my program. I'm going to go through a lot of stuff really fast. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the first two or three slides because that's the, the real idea of the images. So, what here we go is once upon a time, architects felt like they had to design the climate, both cities and buildings. So, that ended really. To the most part, with hermetically sealed things. It's going back to a certain degree with sustainability. So, what you see is the administration building on campus. And if you can imagine why it's seen here, the uh, architect of the campus standing up a copy today, saying in 1924, what did we do? He knew he had to respond to climate, climate. He went to Europe, he did his architects go to Europe, go to Europe. Down Madrid. I don't know if it looks like the same color to you, but it is. Madrid and all the have similar comments. So he matched where the administration came from. He went to Madrid for an exploration. So that carried through campus. So part of that was covered walkways. We know shade is important in some way. So our major Churches carried that through, major institutions, as did the Holy Center, the Depot, uh, Love High School. So you, you see this sort of Spanish influence that came directly from, even though you see it in some days, for style and culture. So the Texas Courthouse Square, Spanish inspired. No, oh, it's climate, it's Spanish inspired. And over here you see uh, Lubbock, and what was one city block plaza in the middle of the city. There was the Capitol Courthouse, ultimately torn down that street, opened a new courthouse, thinking of what was that plaza. So, here's our suggestion. Let's go back to Madrid, who is a city of courtyards. Courtyards make sense in our climate, protection from that wind and the harshness. And we take what is alley, see the plus sign? It's not all that hard easy to see, but downtown Lubbock is a city of alley, alleys and a plus sign. Uh, and we had some installations there. Those alleys are wind tunnels. So <clears throat> another thing you need to know about downtown 
It's 94% paid. So here's our here's our suggestion. We start closing alleys at the perimeter, like the wind, keep them connected in the middle of the courtyard and center of the block. That does a number of things for us. Okay, Carmel by the city is also. And these courtyards can take on various personalities, whether they're commerce, performance, passive, active, depending on their setting and what they're next to. Uh, and this would be an example where we're talking about tech hub. We were doing this convincing our developers this is a good idea. So we're saying this is the way you get four blocks to work like one block is a big project rather than super block, which is the term that's being put in real time. So that's something what uh, our little interconnected courtyards would be. You keep the city together bridges in. Most of the two tall buildings are pioneer in, in uh, NPS. And then if you take this particular four blocks where the courthouse is, all you really have to do Close one street, take out one building, connect it to another four blocks, and you begin to get, see, here it is in 3D, there's the courthouse. There's a photo of our old central plaza. We can now get, we, we, we looked at Clyde Warren Park, it's inspiration, Discovery Green and Houston as well. We can begin to get that central plaza back in downtown London. Interconnected. To this would be one of the one blocks with a courtyard in the middle. That's the OJT Penny's building, what used to be little, but still is little shops and restaurants, but still enough land that you can get new development. This is when we converted an alley to a one space. It's a, a temporary urbanism. Uh, that's where we learned that these were the wind tunnels. That first hand experience. Uh, and that was it. Go back. But so here we are. Argues that courtyards and pauses can and should be developer friendly, ends and sustainable. So that was probably 30 seconds. <laughs> hey, if it cuts the wind, I don't care if it's 30 seconds or 30 minutes. Or that's all that matters. Uh, our next panel is Dr. Jennifer Fanaz. She's the assistant professor. The Atmospheric Sciences Group within the Geosciences Department. Uh, she received her Bachelor's uh, Science in Environmental, Earth Sciences, and Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. That's a long title. Uh, from the University of, of Gulf. Well, well okay. <laughs> Your spelling's not just straight. Uh, in Ontario, Canada. Uh, she continued at the University of Gulf and received her PhD in Atmospheric Sciences there. She specializes in the study of human biometeorology and bioclimatology, examining the separate and combined impacts of weather and climate on human health, specifically focusing on extreme heat, atmospheric radiation, and air pollution exposure in urban areas. She is on the American Meteorological Society's Board of Environmental and Health, or Environment and Health, and an integral member of the International Society of Biometeorology as chair of the students and new professionals group, facilitating and implementing air national connections and workshops for SNP members. Ladies and gentlemen, there for us. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. So I'll try and do my quick spiel here in less than five minutes for Kylie. Um, yes, I come from Canada, the University of Guelph. Uh, it's cold up there right now. Um, probably colder than here, but a lot of what I'll talk about today is bioclimatic design. So that's designing for the climate in mind, which is what David just taught us about, and we um, designed here based on lessons learned in the same climate zone in Spain. Um, but I'm going to talk about mostly designing for extreme heat, and how you design with hot temperatures, hot climates, and hot cities, and then prepare for it getting warmer. So we talk a lot about climate change and climate variability, Globally, um, I'm going to take it down to the street level and talk about microclimatic design in urban areas. Um, and this is actually a picture that I took in Seoul, Korea this summer. And we can look at urban areas very differently, whether we're focused on an urban canyon or an urban forest or somewhere in the middle or a courtyard, like David is just showing us. Um, so the classic urban heat island, which Hopefully many people have heard of, but if not, it's the increased temperatures in urban areas as compared to rural areas. This is your classic shape. 
Um, and we can get variations between suburbia, park, residential downtown. Generally, people see it as it's hotter in urban areas than a rural area. All right, that tells us a very broad picture of the story, but classic urban heat island is not what I'm necessarily interested in looking at. I'm interested in getting deeper into within the urban heat island, what are the variations? And this is how my artwork goes. These are my spittles to show intra-urban variability of temperature and that it's, it's going to vary um, throughout an urban area. What else we see is that as the, the temperatures are, are rising, we're going to see um, increasing extremes within those already extreme areas. And on top of that, the inequal there's inequalities in um, the social resources that we use to mitigate heat or the people that receive those resources. So for example, air conditioning and socioeconomic that influences who's going to suffer from extreme heat, which is actually um, the leading cause of death due to weather um, in this country. So I'm interested in then looking at within these spaces, what makes a space cooler? What makes a space hotter? And how can we focus on these spaces that are so hot, requiring so much more energy in hot areas in the summer season and bringing that peak down? Because if we have a, a two degrees um, or if we have a five degrees warming here, but it's less eight degrees Celsius cooler here, how can we take lessons from here and apply it here? And that's bioclimatic urban design, essentially. But there's a lot of biophysical processes going on. So key questions here is how can we improve measurements within urban areas, not using an airport station, but using measurements in an urban area um, to create targeted solutions for some of those uh, issues? And then what role does urban design play in climate mitigation and adaptation. So first question, um, it's really important to be getting finer scale data. We can't use that larger urban heat island dome and then take that information and try and get targeted solutions within an urban area. But we can have finer air temperature information, radiation, remote sensing is getting really good at this as well. Um, then we can provide the appropriate design recommendations to people like David. <laughs> and work together to create these really nice spaces that are not only nice looking, but also thermally comfortable in a way that people will use them and they're safe, so they're not going to be causing um, higher temperatures. Um, and energy use is important as well. So within an urban area, one of the most important contributors to the urban heat island is the radiation. What's being absorbed, what's being emitted, what's causing those temperatures to go up? Because that use of impermeable surfaces, such as the 94% impermeable surface in downtown Lubbock, is what absorbs all the heat and re radiates it um, as long with energy that we feel as hot, right? If you're using uh, cooler surfaces, such as vegetated surfaces, water, parks, shade, then that doesn't radiate heat as much as um, using it for other forms of transformation to be latent heat. And then I wanted to quickly mention how we look at a human in one of these environments is rear cylinders. And so there are all these different radiant fluxes on a human that we're interested in understanding and how that connects with health and how that connects with urban design and where is it going to be shaded, where is it not going to be shaded. And so these are all um, uh, pieces of information that can help us try and uh, do these targeted interventions with ways to work. Um, getting urban stations like this up more, um, within urban areas and understanding what a surface like uh, artificial turf does to the heat balance or does to heat stress of a human, or you can put it over kind of any station, but getting more information at finer scales really helps us with this. And then even infrared. So this is the infrared picture taken of, of a playground. This is actually a tree here, it's hard to see. And then this is concrete and asphalt. And so you can see just what the, the changes in design uh, can do for heating. And then obviously over airborne remote sensor helps with that too. And then finally, what role does urban design have in climate mitigation? So compare uh, what a park cooling island can do. And this is a decrease um, of about, I think we found about five or six degrees Celsius. This is data we collected in Toronto um, in the park. So we took a bike through with all this uh, instruments on the bike. And if we can get a cooling from a park cooling island of five degrees Celsius, then that two degrees Celsius we might see in 300 years from climate change and warming doesn't matter as much. It's important, obviously, but if we can start doing targeted adaptation interventions within urban areas to bring the temperatures down um, naturally, 
that's adaptation. And then you have mitigation, which is yes, let's let's stop producing um, this, this the climate change. So a mitigation example is then taking this, we decrease, we can, if, if we have higher air temperatures in urban areas, that increases the use of air conditioning, that increases the air conditioning output from the uh, air conditioners, and then that increases air temperature. It's a positive feedback loop. But we can go the opposite and decrease the air temperature, decrease air conditioning, decrease the energy use that's needed. So that's just an example of mitigation um, with climate change, um, but you have to have them both hand in hand to solve some of these problems. So that is my spiel, and hopefully we can discuss it after Jason. Being from Canada now, I know why you study heat. <laughs> <laughs> My wife from Colorado, I can't get her to go back there, so I'm going to go back to the world. So. <clears throat> Our final panelist is Jason Hodges, who is a professional landscape architect at Prairie Workshop, which is a landscape architectural company specializing in the design of outdoor spaces to inspire uh, appreciation of water wise aesthetics. Jason is an award winning uh, landscape architect specializing in sustainable site planning and design. His knowledge of water wise plants, landscape irrigation, and low impact development techniques are assets that make him a valuable design consultant. He received his uh, BA in anthropology and environmental studies and received his Master of Landscape Architecture from Texas Tech University. He has more than 20 years of industry experience, including 10 years as campus landscape architect for Texas Tech University system. Maybe you can explain why we root up all the plants every six months. Um, he's received many honors and awards, uh, one being uh, Lubbock Chamber of Commerce Water Smart Landscape Design Award in 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, Jason Hunt. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Um, resilient landscapes. Resiliency is a very important characteristic of of outdoor spaces that I work in, and it's something I strive for in design. I'm going to read something from Aldo Leopold who uh, tried to capture the concept of ecological resilience, and I'll take that to landscaping place. He said, uh, Health is the capacity of the land for self renewal. Conservation is our effort to understand and preserve this capacity. So when I read that, um, I've always tried to, uh, in every project, uh, no project is perfect, can't do it all in one project, but I'll take baby steps in each project. And I always try to incorporate elements that will um, design in a capacity of some sort for a landscape to self-renew, regenerate itself. The problem with landscape is really aesthetics. You know, people like neat, tidy, predictability, uh, something they can replicate, and that's a problem um, you know, for us. So aesthetics is really key to problem solving for me and uh, trying to build things that are uh, beautiful first and uh, the processes that we try to integrate are often hidden. So we try to expose those processes through design and make them uh, hand in hand with that beauty so that they can be understood as something that is beautiful. Um, the photograph, for instance, um, two things, two characteristics of resilient landscapes um, are complexity and permeability, those are the two really main ones. And complexity really in the, in the landform, uh, complex landforms, not not just uh, predictable, um, you know, um, same landform slopes throughout. And this, this spills over into um, one of the key elements I incorporate are just slowing water down in landscapes, wherever they are, in urban spaces, rural areas. Uh, we try to slow the water down and capture it. And, and expose it rather than placing it in a pipe or a gutter and getting rid of it. We try to slow it, hold it for a moment, and celebrate it. Um, I'm going to flip through a lot of these um, and just get to um, concepts like this. The meadow instead of a lawn. So instead of uh, a mowed lawn, we uh, try to incorporate landscapes that have a lawn and maybe it's once a year or more. Uh, once a month would be even better, you know, than weekly. Um, this is Blue Verona, and so um, I've got a uh, Blue Verona is a native grass. The things that some of the processes that native plants do for us are, are, are increase the soil's ability to infiltrate uh, moisture, water. Um, it also opens up the micro uh, pores in the soil. So these are 
you know, by using native plants in the landscapes, um, doing any kind of, sorry, I'm flipping through some of these some case studies. Um, Kansas, um, very similar to Lubbock, Texas, 18 inches. Um, studying water, you know, on site, wherever we go, uh, water harvesting, usually in a passive form, try rather than active. Uh, but we also do some active harvesting. If you look at a 10 by 10 grid um, in Wallace County, which gets 18 inches a year, similar to Lubbock, you can stack milk jugs onto the landscape in a 10 by 10 grid. And that's, that'd be the annual rainfall. That just boggles my mind when I see that. Think about the landscape out there. That's how much rainfall on average over the course of the year um, hits the ground. So where does it go? What do you do with that? Um, you know, we, if you just look around when you leave here, and if you've ever fallen to a drop of rain and done that, you realize that there is a lot of water to manage. And so we, we really try to rely, we, we do calculations like this to figure out how big of an area do we need on site to, to hold that water? Um, how many plants, what types of plants? Um, and then one of the big things that separates landscape architects from other uh, professionals that are design professionals is really the planting design. So this is where we can have the biggest benefit, biggest impact, I think, on sustainability and resilience is selecting the proper plant material to grow. Um, fescue, um, as you know, is a huge water hog. Fescue in the sun on slope is like people. So um, how much water do we use? You know, this would be on a summer day. Um, remember the stack of, of, of rain jugs. And then, so you've got, you know, native turf, versus some of the hybrid Bermudas, fescues. So you can chime in on this one. But, um, you know, much less water, you know, for a native plant, um, native grass, turf. Management also plays into that. You can get more mileage out of out of plants by doing less to them, um, leaving them alone and, and uh, doing things. But just, you know, this alone on a site can make or break the feasibility study of, of harvesting rain. Um, to try to water with rainfall. We just can't water fescue with, with the rainfall we receive. Just not enough water. But we can have a, a beautiful, resilient blue grama lawn or meadow. Um, and so, you know, we, do, we do some tank, uh, rain tank designs um, in our landscapes. But we don't, you know, this, this becomes overloaded you know, really quickly. And so, landscapes like this that are resilient, beautiful, uh, that's really my goal is to make them beautiful so people, um, at least they're, they're seeing beauty. And then the processes that are often hidden, we try to expose them as landscapes so that they become part of that uh, memory, you know, of, of what you saw and what you experienced. Um, so, that's all I have. Thanks. All right, we'll get all three of our panelists to <clears throat> kind of scooch out in front here. And we'll open the floor for questions. Well, Y'all didn't wait to ask questions last week. Yes, sir. I just have a very simple question about the last uh, things that was up there, and it was very attractive. And uh, yes, everybody in town pretty much did that, and it would really be wonderful. But in that particular one, what about the standing water and mosquitoes? It was away um, in less than eight hours on that particular site. So part of the process, you can't just you can't just dig a hole or lay it off a piece of ground. Um, it, you have to do some things that are. Uh, can't compact it, so a lot of times we'll over excavate at the bottom. Um, put in a, uh, a, a bat if it's big enough. That site just had some hand dug uh, gravel filled areas, so you, you, you kick start that, that infiltration process. And you have to do the math, you know, you have to know how big your your uh, capture area, your, your rooftop is, and how much water you're going to see on, on a rainfall. That site, you know, we the goal was to capture usually. A, a one to two inch rainfall on the site. That's 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 just the standard goal we have. Yeah, you're going to have bigger rain, so you have you know, plan in an outlet so it can get out. You know, we're civil engineers a lot, 
you got to make sure it keeps me out of trouble. So, um, but that that site um, drains in uh, Central Lubbock, drains out uh, in a day or less. Uh, so there's no mosquito problem. It's actually it's actually solving part of the mosquito problem by not putting that water downstream in, in standing areas. Where, where is that? I want to go look at it. That is uh, Ed and Cecilia George. Uh, here in Lubbock. It's uh, I want to say it's near uh, Knox Hold out uh, 40, 46, 42. It's been a while, been a few years since that. That's that just a real watershed project for me, literally. I mean, it's one of those with a client who was just on, on board and that she is, she is a green thumb too, so it helps out. I saw somebody take it, take it to the extreme the other day. I drive by a house and somebody had put down artificial turf as their lawn, which <laughs> You may be able to study now because now their kids won't be able to play in the front yard in the summer because it's going to be 150 degrees. Uh, any other question? I, I want to say that I, I actually use artificial turf. And they say, oh my God, who are you? Um, I, I use our, it's a tool that I use, and I'll tell you, there's a, there's a place and time for almost any material. And I use it as a permeable pavement. So it's, it, it actually drains really rapidly, but crushed gravel under it as a standard. So it, um, you've got a built-in uh, permeable pavement. But I, I like to put trees over it. So you don't have to lots of trees. So, so I want to know where the grass is that you only have to mow once a year. So you just sign me up for that stuff. Yes, sir. On the alleys, now we use them for utility, utility lines, <coughs> trash collection, and all of that. How do you? I can see a lot of people saying, "Well, I, I." Uh, City planner has looked at this and it is quite encouraging because there still is within each lobby, each out in each block, an L shaped of alley, which gives them a place where the all the candy can go. Within the super block concept, everything comes out, which is much more difficult. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was saying by topic, <coughs> um, I'm struck by that the idea is fantastic, but uh, to help. Move this along, it will help to demonstrate the uh, economic revitalization of the downtown as well. And so, is that also part? We have a partner who does that economic analysis because we need to make that repay and bring people back in to shop and bring them. Well, um, probably our, our strongest advocate at this moment is Mark Raker. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Mark McDougall and that half of the equation is less enthused. There's still more about the super blocks, but um, they're they're able to do those numbers. So uh, when you look at uh, that's that's why that what those projects we're trying to maintain significant residuals, so we don't tear everything down but at the same time, giving up property for substantial development. So uh, we're not we just really. A fairly simple concept. How it gets applied is um, in the hands of people like Mark Rager and Mark Yes. Yeah. Um,
alluded to was how does this work when you get into those spaces that you have, you know, low low income populations or maybe some other things going on, homeless. I'm not sure what other kinds of things you deal with. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Like what happens when you find those high um, extremes in you know maybe one place where you can't afford to do a really great redesign versus a place where the resources are lower but something needs to happen. Yeah, there's definitely a push more towards trying to make sure that these that inequalities like that don't exist as much. But research has led us to this point where we're really recognizing it now because we have the information. But the city that's been studied the most for this issue is Phoenix and seeing that their low income, low socioeconomic areas are also the hottest of the least green space, of the least air conditioning um, usage in a city like Phoenix. So it's not good. So what a lot of researchers have done is kind of push that forward, try and recognize that that's where a lot of the targeted adaptation and education needs to be going on within the city. And then um, provide uh, ways for people to handle the heat, such as opening cooling centers nearby. Um, they've done a lot of social surveys in those areas. And just having uh, you know urban planners and landscape architects come on board and understand that you know we need more water retreats here, but we need to do it in a sustainable way and in a city like Canada does a path there water is harder to understand those processes and um, yeah that's um, people recognizing that more but providing the evidence base is what's needed and that's where I come in with my measurements that's what I try and, try and do for <laughs> yes, I'm trying to understand the, the last graphic that you showed yeah. Yeah. and the, the Toronto data oh, yeah, yeah. that you had on the left edge it showed the scale it was 22.5 to 25 degrees C along that scale, mm -hmm. and the, the park so showed some things there. But you referred to five or six degrees C. Yeah. Did, I, did I misunderstand so, the graph? So, the average, so I, yeah, so that was a bit of a complicated graph to throw up in that top, but it was just showing the decrease in air temperature that a uh, person would experience if they went through that tiny park within an urban area. So, it would be the week left in Toronto. 2011, I think, and um, we did a few different parks. And the main message from that is that park cooling islands in general in the literature have been shown to range in terms of the amount of cooling they can produce from like three to eight degrees Celsius. Um, for that specific graph, I think it was five degrees Celsius that we found the maximum cooling from the street to within the park. Um, and that was to demonstrate what we can do by conserving these spaces, by making them resilient, by making sure that they're not taken out of urban areas because they essentially act as natural air conditioners. Um, it obviously depends on the composition of the park and if there's you know, water available, if it's dry or, or moist and such. Um, and then to compare it to what kind of temperatures we are uh, like expecting with the changing climate and to say that I'm trying to understand the magnitude. The entire chart was two and a half degrees. And the line so it was just, didn't, didn't it was go just top to show off. a delta. Yeah, just to show a delta in air temperature from the street, it might have averaged 27 degrees on the street and then dropped to 21 in the park and then went back up again in air temperature. Mm -hmm. yeah. Concerned about getting that, um, I'm surprised that when you talk about what cities are the most. Came up with another piece in Phoenix. I thought you were going to make Philadelphia. Yeah. Okay. So it brings up my question. Tesla has recently announced uh, solar panel roofing is going to be aesthetic, like pleasing, and so forth. Do yeah. you have any idea whether they incorporated uh, estimates of how that might change the heat balance and the regular roof versus solar panel? This is probably the number one question we get when you talk about solar and then cool roofs at the same time. Um, I don't know for Tesla specifically, um, but when you're trying to incorporate um, solar roofs on that roof, it's helpful to not attach it directly to the house so that the heat doesn't conduct into the house because they move through heat and they are dark. Um, so even just getting them with a foot of space off the top of the roof is helpful. But for Tesla, they're designing the panels that are directly attached, and I don't know how hot those get. So 
story. I don't know if they're reflective at all either. So they might have considered that in their design. And obviously the direction that they're facing is important to get as much solar exposure as possible, but that results in a much heat as well. So there are going to be trade-offs with the Well, again, in terms of the aesthetics, if, if uh, you want to have them on a south-facing roof, your neighbors might not like that too much. But if they look like a regular roof, then yeah, exactly. what do you do? Keep them out of your hair. <laughs> yes, sir. What do we know about the trade-offs Serve water, but if you don't irrigate your lawn, it's going to be hotter. So you're either saving water or you're increasing the temperature. How do you do that? I don't have any direct study you know, the, the part about the street. They talk about the cow and you know, uh, most of it. I would say that um, there is soil moisture. Is, Really, where I would go towards, um, you yeah, know, not having moisture locked up in so much in the vegetation, but in the soil itself as an insulator to, you know, frequent changes in temperature. I, I think uh, native plants do a lot, you know, for, for that. So I think there's um, the typical plant you're irrigating all the time in a very short root zone. Uh, you know, it's a lot of that water evaporates. Um, um, and so it kind of goes hand in hand with creating this, um, just that different, the totally different, I guess, soil profile, root zone profile that goes along with that. But that's an interesting question, you know, that I, I see a lot more related to kind of gravel, you know, maybe rock gardens or something that would expanse with just exposed rock. You know, uh, there's definitely, you know, some challenges. That's why you know, so, you know, I'll see a vegetated ground cover is always better. Um, and I, I can add a thing because I think their season differs a lot in what they compare to California. Season. And so the studies therefore are going to be different and persistent. What's good, what is the less water, what's results in the less least energy usage. I know that if you're thinking about like a very steep yard that is like the gravel and dirt, like you might see in a lot of Phoenix, or that California is actually giving like three days for I think. It results in higher daytime temperatures and lower nighttime temperatures because you don't have the moisture in the air around the house. Um, and so that's the trade off that people can decide how they want to deal with. If they're not home during the day, then maybe they're okay with that. Um, and then it's going to differ if you're there sleeping with the native uh, grasses and, and love it. But I think that whether you're there sleeping or not, she's going to actually decrease the temperature substantially and then decrease the loss of water from the surface and then therefore hold it in and, and then you don't have so much sensitivity of the property. But that's what I know in general about the daytime versus nighttime. Yeah, there must be, a, I mean, there's obviously a calculation where you have a tipping point between how much landscape you have to have along a standard lot and, and lot that has to be vegetated, you know, and what side of the yard is best to vegetate. Compared to change because that because obviously you're you know if you're on an east side or a west side or the north side your temperatures are very different and so there must be you know I think one of the things that we might want to look at is if you're going to do a plant for lumber what is the best ratio between vegetation and non vegetation and what side of the yard because one of the other things I've noticed around Lubbock is they don't pay attention to what how they orient houses from the building or how many windows face west or how many face you know because they don't they don't pay attention to that. But that's a big impact on how, how much heating and cooling goes on. And, 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 uh, that's all by design. Well, it is. Yeah, right, so right. vegetation on the mm -hmm. south side, blocking the south side, and not the highest right. side. And what type? Right. Right. But I don't know. Well, it's, it's not, well, I wasn't, I wasn't likely to the urban scale. Our, it's, this is nothing really scientific about this, but our goal for downtown is to take it from 6%. Uh, like the, the, the 20 percent. Sure. <laughs> That's not a scientific number. So uh, one of the things that was, you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. So heat also determines how much being reflected back and how much being absorbed. So one of the on the picture that you show when there's a black hole in the Phoenix, and so one of the first thing that we think of is that do you know if the cost 
understand that it was um, it's a native plant that is very intentional, you know, and, and that it's doing a lot of good things. And so that was a good experience that I've had in love. Um it's 30 of the team King House gone by it's never been moved. Um, it's fifteen years plus um, you know, a single woman planted it herself. So anybody can do it. You know, I mean she's in, in the Bel Air, the friends of Bel Air Parks took over all the park metrics so they could control when things are mowed, when things are not mowed, and how things are pruned. They had Saturday classes on Japanese pruning so they could get volunteers to prune the material so they could pop away. The cities are, they're not our best thing makers. <laughs> I mean, they're real good at what they do. But <laughs> it's one thing that's all. <laughs> and of course, they won't let you have goats out in front of you. The regulations are there. There's a lot of um, a lot of people that will you know, try to get away with, with, with any kind of you know, I've, I've stood in line, you know, with my plans with my own, my client, and then another another person <laughs> had the same plan with you with their plan. And, you know, it's, it's like a chicken scratch. You know, there's no professional seal on it. Calculation. Uh, so, you know, the regulations are there for a reason. Um, but we all have to try and funnel through there. So, um, cities are, you know, yeah, you have to have a different approach. You, know, you have a different idea. Um, you know, with the, in the, the 2020 vision for all the federal process, and it was online. You know, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. So, it was a sort of a back. Flag against zero scaping. But the images that would come up were really zero scaping and we're yeah. zero scaping. Yeah. So there's a lot of. Hmm. You guys were just about to point in and information. I sit on the um, Love Up and Buy Water Advisory Committee. And one of the things we've been looking at is construction of a building. That's a bolt. Is encouraging citizens not to 
to be treated water, water the landscapes. And thus, it gets me willing to help penalize them on when they do that. <laughs> and instead, we turn it the other way. So it sounds like to me, some of you guys may need to come in front of our community as we're trying to make a recommendation to city council. Because the, the sense I'm getting from the, the studies that are going on is that audits for individuals will lead to more water savings and for example changing how you water your yard and what's in the design and everything like that than buying the low culture which will just plus you guys because it is <laughs> <laughs> I mean that tends to be the study that, that an audit and, and educating those who want to do it. So I was wondering if any of you would now be talking to Audrey Spears in the water accept an invitation if I get one for <laughs> Because it's, it sounds like there's some things that if you go to a program where the city is willing to pay someone to come to your house and say how to save water, some of the things you guys are talking about should be part of the package. But my, my experience with that, and, and maybe you guys have different experiences, if, it, if it's about advocacy, you really have to go to the city council members. The department heads are really about enforcing the ordinance and they get little or no benefit for being innovative. But if it comes to them from a council member, I mean they can they can this innovate. is a committee that it belongs to you as citizens that was designed to advise the departments and the council at the same time. Yeah I'm one of those two. I learned from you. Tell me how it works. <laughs> I think the one of the good things that city law needs Demonstration garden. You call it a nature center. You can do lots of things. We don't really have that. Um, yeah, we have arboretum. Yeah, we have um, you know, a few gardens that the city worked on years ago. But we don't really have a public place where we're educating um, people about things like culture, about how much water you know, this uses versus that. And anybody been to Lakeburg Golf Club Center? I don't know if they still have it, but they used to have this wonderful little, you know, you walk through and you see, okay, this landscape looks like this, it uses this, and this landscape does this. So you kind of see it, feel it, taste it, you know, see the numbers behind it. Utah, um, Salt Lake City is a water conservation district that, that has a South Jordan, I think, South Jordan Water Conservation District. Wonderful garden there. People go there, they just, just to enjoy it, but they're learning this. They've got signs on everything. We don't really have that. I think that would go along with, you know, so people can see it for themselves. Try, to, you know, try to build that into yeah. the campus, you know, working here for three years. Because I know people come here and take ideas. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. see things and they're like, oh, I want that. I want to do something, something like that. You know, there's very little didactic information you know, out there. Uh, I know we've got some other questions, but unfortunately we've got a class coming in at one, so we kind of have to, to get out of here. I'm sure they'd be happy to answer your questions individually out in the hall uh, afterward. But uh, before we get out, let's give all our panelists another chance. Uh, we'll continue this next semester, so y'all come back again. Same bad time, same bad time.